and make a special thanks to Eric and Melinda Chow and Jay Banner for making this event possible and everybody else who helped them at ESI. Uh, just a reminder, you know, put your cell phones on mute if you could. Uh, and uh, I can check mine as well. <laughs> and I'd like to uh, recognize that with us tonight are a couple of the editors for the Texas Water Journal, Robert Mace and Kathy Alexander. They're in the back. Uh, they're also uh, officers of the uh, Texas Water Journal 501c3 board as well. And so let me tell you a little bit about the Texas Water Journal. We started publishing the journal in 2010. Uh, it's an online peer-reviewed journal devoted to the timely consideration of Texas water resource management and policy issues from a multidisciplinary perspective uh, by uh, integrating science, engineering, law, planning, and other disciplines. Uh, we bring the journal to you, and uh, we also provide uh, the best we can updates on some key legislative and policy changes uh, by Texas administrative agencies. The journal is free uh, and it's online. You can go to www.texaswaterjournal.org to sign up. And if you do, we'll send you notifications when we publish new articles. Uh, you'll also find there a Texas uh, water events calendar that has uh, groundwater district uh, meeting dates, uh, river authority meeting dates, uh, water conferences, all sorts of water information, as well as. Uh, Water journal or water newspaper articles uh, that are collected uh, on the internet. And uh, I'd also like to mention we have two articles coming out this week. One is by Ken Bakke uh, at Texas Tech. This is a commentary about uh, groundwater districts and the drought and the panhandle. And Joseph Spalachek uh, at the University of Texas. And his article is about freshwater inflow requirements for the Oasis Delta. I need to mention that the War Journal's publishing cooperation with the Texas Water Resources Institute and Texas A&M has, has been a great relationship so far. So, if you want to follow the Water Journal on Twitter, it's at TX Water Journal. And we've got uh, a hashtag set up tonight, uh, hashtag PWJ Forum. And we are going to try to hold future forums in other cities and other universities. Depending on how this one goes. <laughs> 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 my Rubio moment. <laughs> there you go, that's true. And uh, at any rate, we are being webcast tonight, and we're going to have this uh, the video on the Texas Water Journal website. And now are you all going to put it on the ESI website here? It will be there as well eventually. So let me go ahead and introduce our, our, our panel of. of uh, speakers or panelists, I guess, tonight. They all were authors for our 83rd Texas Legislative uh, Summit, which came out in August and, and contained a number of uh, points of views about what happened in the Texas Legislative Session that uh, concluded, uh, well, I guess it concluded at the end of the summer. First of all, let me uh, introduce to you Brad Castleberry. He's a principal in the law firm of Lloyd uh, Gosling, Rochelle, and Townsend. Practices water law, natural resources, environmental permitting, and construction litigation. And he represents a variety of clients. He works on issues uh, associated with uh, the TCQ. And he's also a key member of uh, Water Environment Association of Texas. He's got a Bachelor's of Science um, from the University of Texas and a, a, a Juris Doctor from UT as well. Ken Kramer. And it's a person in the middle. Sort of. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> He's the volunteer water resources chair and legislative advisor for the Lone Star chapter of the Sierra Club. And uh, he just retired, not uh, maybe about a year ago or so, uh, after being the director of the Lone Star chapter of the Sierra Club for about 23 years. And uh, he has a BA in history from Texas Lutheran and uh, an MA in Political Science from Stephen F. Austin, and a PhD in Political Science from Rice. Dean Robbins is on the other side of Ken. He 
He's the assistant general manager of the Texas Water Conservation Association, a statewide organization consisting of real authorities, water districts, cities, industries, uh, consulting firms, and others. And the TWCA acts in an advisory capacity to the U.S. Congress, Texas legislature, and government agencies on water issues. It provides a form for exchanging thoughts and ideas on water. And uh, Dean is also a graduate of the University of Texas with a degree in civil engineering. I didn't plan this, so we would all be UT grads. Just want to say that. And uh, I guess it will be obvious because our our final pass is not a graduate of the University of Texas. Uh, Stacy Steinbach is the executive director of the Texas Alliance of Groundwater Districts, a nonprofit association of groundwater districts in the state of Texas. And uh, she also serves as the uh, Groundwater Conservation District Representative on the Texas Water Conservation Advisory Council. And previously she worked for the Texas General Law, uh, Land Office. Stacy has a Bachelor of Science in Biology and Ecology from Baylor, a Master's of Science from uh, the uh, Texas a and University in Wildlife and Fishery Sciences, and a Juris Doctor Doctor. Uh, from the University of Montana School of Law. So, got to go that far. <laughs> so let me just set the stage a little bit. When our graphics were, were rotating, like we were hoping they would do, uh, you would see that we are still in a drought in Texas, and the drought in some places is much more severe than the uh, chart up here might show. And the reason for that is we are still in a hydrologic drought in the western part of the state. Uh, the Edwards Aquifer in San Antonio is in stage two drought, and the western part of that aquifer is in stage five drought. The Highland Lakes, everybody's heard about uh, the concerns about their level right now. They're about 36% uh, full collectively. And the state climatologist is warning that uh, we may be in a really long drought cycle. You know, it's hard to tell, but. We are kind of past our fall rain peak, and uh, we may be going into next year uh, in relatively dry condition, and we might be facing uh, a, a difficult situation at a number of uh, river basins and with a number of aquifers next year. Also, as Eric mentioned, uh, we've just passed uh, Proposition 6, creating a $2 billion uh, fund to help uh, in the funding of water projects, and that fund's managed by the Texas Water Development Board. There are key retirements in the legislature, and there have been changes at the Water Development Board. And we also have two court cases that have really murky the picture for groundwater in the state of Texas. So, so I'm going to kick off our discussion with our first question, and all the panels can jump in. Uh, and then Ken, you're, you're first up. So, uh, with all the, uh, these uncertainties and changes, uh, we have an election coming up in less than a year, and it's going to be the, the first uh, change in the governor's office since 2001, but uh, there are a number of other statewide offices that will turn over. So, my question to you is, will water issues play a role in the election, uh, or, you know, or you know, not only the governor's race, but any of the other statewide races? 2014. Well, it's a little bit hard to say at this point. Um, it seems to me that, uh, in, for example, the lieutenant governor's race in the primary, uh, they're not really discussing issues right now. So maybe when they get past that uh, and look at some issues, water will come up. Uh, you know, most of the uh, public officials uh, who are contending for statewide office are being discussed uh, in terms of being potential contenders for statewide office in 2014 in Texas, uh, were supportive of Proposition 6. Uh, and I think to a great extent, um, there is not that much difference among the candidates as I see it at this point in terms of statewide offices as to how they uh, would approach uh, dealing with water issues. Uh, you know, I think uh, Senator Davis, who's running for the Democratic nomination for governor, uh, voted for uh, the water legislation in the past session. Um, all the other statewide contenders for other offices uh, came out in support of Proposition 6. Uh, 
So, water may be discussed, but I don't see that there's necessarily, at this point, uh, a great deal of difference among the statewide candidates. Uh, now, in certain races, in certain state legislative races, you might see uh, more of a contentious uh, discussion about water. Uh, certainly, some of the uh, state legislators in East Texas and some of the legislative candidates uh, are very interested and concerned about uh, property rights potentially being affected, impacted by uh, decisions about what water projects would be funded uh, under the new funding and existing funding for that matter. Uh, but I really think if the water issue comes up, it's going to be very individualized in certain state legislative districts and probably not likely to be a major statewide issue in the state races. Do you think the passage of Prop 6 maybe uh, has uh, kind of uh, kind of taken some of the uh, the uh, attention off the water issue with that regard because that was the big, that's the big political issue with regard to water in recent years. Yeah, I uh, I have the history now of having been around the state legislature, uh, representing Sierra Club as a volunteer first and then as a professional for a number of years now as a volunteer again. Uh, and I've seen a lot of legislative sessions, and there does seem to be sort of a pattern to the legislative sessions that. Uh, if during one legislative session, uh, legislators perceive that they have addressed a major issue like water, uh, there's less likelihood that in the next session or two that water is going to be a big issue. Uh, one caveat to that is that uh, there is still a lot of uh, discussion about how we deal with groundwater in this state. Uh, there have been recent court decisions that uh, speak to the issue of groundwater ownership and how it's managed. Uh, and just uh, in the 2011 legislative session, we had some major legislation on groundwater. And uh, some legislative leaders, like uh, Senator Frazier, who's the chairman of the Senate Natural Resources Committee, uh, has indicated, have indicated that they want to uh, try to tackle some groundwater issues next session. Uh, and there's some leftover business, if you will, with brackish groundwater and desalination uh, of seawater uh, from the last session that may play into that. So, I, you know, I, I think water every session is an issue to some extent, uh, but I think it's also the case that with the passage of Proposition 6, uh, there may not be as much attention to water. Now, if the drought continues and or intensifies in many parts of the state over the next couple of years, then we're, I think, going to see a different scenario. Stacy, uh, what do you think is going to happen with regard to uh, legislation for groundwater next session? <laughs> Just look, take your crystal ball out. And... Well, I think I think you can look at what was on the table last session, and I think all those things will be back on the table. Um, Ken mentioned brackish groundwater. I think there's no question that um, we're going to be talking a lot about brackish groundwater. I think. Um, oil and gas in groundwater, fracking in groundwater due to an exemption in um, Chapter 36 of the Water Code and some ambiguity there and some differences in interpretation between even, even districts and, um, and the oil and gas community. So there, was, there were, I think, three bills last session and all of them died. So those, I think, will all be, um, will come back up. And I think um, long-term permitting, which I think this is the third or fourth session where um, they tried to address long-term permitting bill. And what we have with long-term permitting is... Um, you know, water users want certainty in their permits, and they want to know that they have a, a standard supply of water for certain years in the future, especially if they're putting in a lot of capital infrastructure. But what you have when you have day, and, and even now brag to some extent, you create more uncertainty for groundwater districts. So there becomes a question is, um, can I lock up this water for 30 years when I don't know who's going to come in the door, and my statutory requirement is to manage to the DFC, and I have to do that or else, you know, I'm not fulfilling my statute. What's a DFC? Yeah, so a DFC is a desired future condition, and the way that um, groundwater is managed in this state, uh, we have local districts, but they join together in groundwater management areas, and those are essentially areas kind of over a similar, the same aquifer. And they, put to they get together and they do this public planning process and they create a desired future condition, and that's essentially what they think the aquifer should look like in the next 50 years. They, they look at all the uses, all the future needs, and they create this, this DFC. And then that, that DFC goes to the Water Development Board, and they do a process where they um, 
put together a modeled available groundwater, which is a tool that districts can use in making sure they're helping achieve it. It's not just the only tool. They, they also look at rain patterns and weather and uses and exempt uses. Um, but, but that's the district's mandate. And so as we, you know, as we, we, we haven't had that a lot right now, but as districts uh, more often come into maybe reaching or getting close to their DFC, we're going to have these battles of do we make room for new users or cut back old users. And the long-term permitting thing ties in all of that. There has to be some flexibility for districts to, um, in, you know, encompass day, which says that groundwater is privately owned and make sure that, that everybody kind of gets their share, which is a, which is a, hard, is a challenge. I'm definitely going to ask you about the court cases in a minute, but, <laughs> but I, I do want to follow up and ask. Uh, so, uh, brackish uh, groundwater. I think most people don't really know. Do groundwater districts right now? Are they just regulating uh, fresh groundwater? Are they both? Are they also regulating regulating brackish groundwater? And, and why are we hearing a lot about? Yeah, that's a really that's a that's a heavy question. I think it depends on where you are in the state. I think most districts regulate all water all water within the aquifer in their district. Um, in some areas of the state, you've got 20% of our counties where their me median um, TDS level, and when I say TDS, total dissolved solids, most of you know and are familiar with that, is 1,000 or above, and that's what we technically consider as brackish. But when we talk about management and policy, using a bright line number of 1,000 TDS is really challenging when you have some districts where most of their water is, is above 1,000 and they're already treating it. Um, but it's also that the, that water is not hydrologically disconnected from the fresh water. So if you start, you know, we've all seen the straw analogies, and if you put a straw down here, because this is where the pocket of, of brackish water is, maybe it's above 1,000 TDS, it still could impact the water levels over here, and it could also cause mixing and impact salinity. And so, um, you know, one of the things that, that TAG did at the Capitol, and we worked with Representative Calgary and, and Representative Larson, uh, and, and Senator Uresti on his bills um, was to really uh, get away from making a bright line 1,000 figure and talk about brackish groundwater production zones, these areas of groundwater that aren't currently being used that aren't necessarily connected to areas that are. And so it, TDS is one factor. There's lots of you know, other factors that we can look at. And so we got very close at the end of session um, that it was the Committee Substitute House Bill 2578 um, I don't know what it'll look like next session, but um, that was very close. I think it went to the Senate and had a hearing, but then didn't get out there. So there are stakeholder groups. I know TWCA is working very hard on the Groundwater Committee to be hopefully getting some of this language worked out before session so we're not in the middle of session and trying to deal with it. Interesting. Um, let me go back to Prop 6. And uh, Dean, I've got a question for you with regard to that. Uh, one of the things I was worried about before the Prop 6 boat was all the rain. I thought, people are going to see everything's green now, the drought's over, you know, maybe they're not going to go out and, and vote for Prop 6, but uh, it passed with 74% approval, somewhere around there, and I was wondering, are you surprised by how well it did, and also, what do you think the fact that it passed with that, uh, that high rate of approval says about how the public sees our the state of our water supply here in Texas? Well, I would say that uh, two years ago we had a, another proposition on the, the ballot, a constitutional amendment that would give the Water Development Board more uh, authority to issue bonds for projects. A lot of people thought that was a no-brainer, uh, but it just barely passed. And so this time, when we're dealing with Prop 6, some of those same people worked a lot harder at educating the public about exactly what, what these issues are that we're going to confront. So that included the Speaker's office, the, the Capitol people generally uh, across the board. As Ken said, most of the, the political world here in Texas was supportive of Prop 6 and a lot of them very uh, active in getting that message out. There were also a number of organizations that, that helped with that cause. So I think that had a lot to do with Tom, may I jump in for a second? Sure. We've got a, quite a few folks watching live on the web. So I'll ask all of you, not only are you projecting through this room, but you're projecting across the world. Oh, okay. So please, please pipe up. 
And we can't hear you that well. Yeah, okay, well, we're going to, let's maybe, I'll turn this way and I'll project a little bit more. Maybe that'll help everybody be loud like I am naturally. Um, so, Brad, I've got a question for you. Uh, we have uh, now, as we just talked, the Prop 6 vote has been successful. We have $2 billion for, for water projects uh, in addition to the money that's already available. And uh, I'm wondering, are we, are we likely to need to more than that, or are we kind of finished for the time being uh, trying to find new sources of money for water in the state? Well, I would say that if you look at the, the state water plan, you know, this is the drop in the bucket in terms of financing. Um, and you know, the bond market can only support so much. Um, the water bill, water bill board can only do so much. And so I think that you know we're going to need more financing options. And I think when you look at the public-private partnership arrangements that are coming out, there's lots of interest in that. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of folks, you know, trying to create uh, creative deals to make projects in the board. So I don't, I think, I don't think we've, <laughs> I don't think we cured our problems. I, I think from a financing perspective, um, and I'm not an expert on finance, but I see a lot of projects that are going to have to be built. The question is, when do they really need to? Be what order, and how do we allocate the funds? And I know that's a big issue that's going on right now with the Water Development Board uh, through their prioritization process. In fact, there was a meeting this morning, uh, the Water Development Board on that, I think you were there. Um, you know, how do we decide which projects deserve the money now, and which ones can we put off for a while? Uh, you know, one of the big issues that I see and what I do on a daily basis is permitting. You know, a permit, to, to secure a permit for a new water supply project can take literally a decade. And so when do you start that funding process for that next project? Do you put it off because you say, hey, I can construct this project now, but really you've got to get through the process of all the state and, and federal, federal regulatory approvals to get new projects built. And, and I think that um, we're going to need the money for that, for those projects that we may not need for two decades. We really need to start planning those now. So you, you get a project in the, in the water plan. That doesn't mean that you get a permit. You still have to get a permit. And you've got to figure out the timing for, for financing that project. Uh, so, Ken, that brings a question to mind that I'd like to ask you. Is uh, state water planning process, it, is it working in Texas? Well, I think that um, many uh, folks probably know that the uh, environmental organizations have been critical of uh, the current state water plan and some of the water plans that really are the building blocks for the state water plan. Um, and among the criticisms that we have are, first of all, that the state water plan does not really address um, environmental water needs in a direct way, in terms of saying, this is what we need in terms of in-stream flows uh, for rivers and streams. This is what we need in terms of freshwater inflows to our state's coastal basin estuaries, and this is how we're going to provide that water. There is another process uh, that has come up with uh, at least tentative standards for environmental flows in some of our river basins, uh, but that process does not guarantee that the water is actually made available for those environmental purposes. So that's one big criticism of our state water plan, is that we don't have that water need addressed in the state water plan. Uh, a second criticism is that from the environmental community's perspective, we think that the state regional water plans tend to overemphasize um, infrastructure projects as ways of providing water supply, uh, rather than emphasizing conservation uh, and, to some extent, reuse uh, with regard to how we meet our future water needs. Now, it is true that even the current state water plan uh, says that uh, approximately 34% of our future water needs uh, have to be met through, or should be met through, conservation or reuse. Uh, but there's a little bit of a flaw there in that uh, it's not necessarily clear that people are doing that kind of conservation and are going to implement those water management strategies to actually conserve water. Uh, there is some progress in that in many parts of the state, and of course we have San Antonio is a shining example of a major city doing conservation. Uh, but there still is less conservation happening than most of us in the uh, environmental community feel uh, can be accomplished. Uh, and I think the final thing is that 
uh, we do tend to, from an environmental perspective, believe uh, that uh, some of the projects that are currently in the plan uh, are actually never going to be built. Uh, Brad has pointed out there are lots of obstacles to those projects. Uh, some of those projects, from our perspective, uh, are not really uh, responsible projects or feasible projects. Uh, and so I think, uh, you know, a lot of people, even some state legislators who you might not uh, expect to hear this from, uh, said during the legislative session that they uh, consider the state water plan to be, to some extent, a wish list of projects that various people wanted to see pursued, but not necessarily one that really pinpointed what projects were needed and when they were needed the most. Uh, that's part of what the prioritization process uh, that is uh, an outgrowth of Prop 6 and its enabling legislation the House Bill 4 is trying to accomplish. Now, I do want to say that I think the planning process uh, in the state of Texas has had a lot of benefit. It's allowed us to amass a great deal of uh, information and knowledge about water needs in the state. Uh, but I think we need to, with this new funding, address some of the imperfections in the planning process and try to make it uh, a better, more comprehensive plan. Well, certainly I was thinking uh, today about the 1968 water plan and the diversion from the Mississippi River and the 50 reservoirs and, the, and Burley's Ditch and, and all that. And there's, there's kind of a progression, it seems, of focusing on engineered solutions and maybe over time there's less of that. Uh, I mean, at what point is there, do you think there's going to be more or less a balance uh, between conservation and, and construction of projects? Are we still just going to continue to see fewer and fewer constructed uh, uh, solutions as part of the, the water plan? Well, I do believe, I am optimistic that conservation and drought management measures are going to be more and more a part of how we address water issues in Texas. Uh, you know, uh, in this most recent discussion about Prop 6 and the enabling legislation, uh, I hope that no one got the impression that the passage of Prop 6 was going to automatically address our current water shortages uh, and actually, you know, take care of the drought. Uh, because as Brad pointed out, a lot of those projects that are called for in the water plan, and some of which I think will still remain in the water plan, are going to take a long time to build. Prop 6 passage was really just the start of the process to try to address this long term. Uh, conservation, being more efficient in the use of water, reducing the amount of water we use, especially for things like outdoor landscaping, uh, which is a, a huge user of municipal water in the state of Texas. Uh, those are the things that can get us the biggest bang for our buck in the shortest period of time. And they're the, really the most cost-effective ways of addressing uh, our water needs, especially in the short term. Uh, so I think there's a lot of incentive for municipal water suppliers and others uh, to address that type of situation first. Where can we shave off that peak water demand that we see in Texas during the heat of the summer when we're throwing water into the air often to try to raise our San Augustine grass crops in big cities in the state of Texas. Uh, those kinds of things, I think, are where we can make the biggest progress first. And perhaps, as we show how more efficient we can become in the use of water uh, in this near-term period, that will translate into long-term practices and measures and behavior that will help us avoid some of the projects in the future. But, you know, I, I think all of us understand that there are going to be needs for uh, new infrastructure or replacement of aging infrastructure in the future. Uh, but we need to start first with how we can better manage the water supplies we have. And I think a big part of that is trying to address the issue of water loss, uh, where you have a number of public water supply systems that are uh, actually losing a lot of their water through aging infrastructure and problems with the industry. You mentioned infrastructure a couple of times there. The uh, water plants cost $53 billion over 50 years, but aging infrastructure is somewhere around $180 billion. Where's the money for that going to come from? Well, you know, the Water Belt Board does already have uh, bonding authorization 
uh, we're trying to address uh, some of that issue. Uh, but I think as Brad pointed out, we really don't have anywhere near the amount of money at the state level at least to address all those infrastructure issues. But I mean, keep in mind that uh, we talk about the state, you know, spending on infrastructure, providing money. Uh, that uh, financial burden really is on the political subdivisions that develop the water projects. If they can come to the state and get help uh, through uh, loans with a lower interest rate than they can get in the private markets. Uh, but uh, a lot of them actually do have the ability to go to the private bond markets themselves and borrow that money for their projects. And so a lot of it's really going to have to come, uh, even initially, I think, from local regional water authorities actually raising the money themselves. Some of that money used to come from the federal budget uh, through various programs the Clean Water Act had. And uh, but that's now going to be made up through uh, uh, payment by uh, local uh, users of that, those projects. I, I don't see a lot of big increases in federal spending in the near future. Well, uh, I've asked several questions about Prop 6, so let me ask you, Dean. Uh, there were other pieces of significant water legislation in this last session. Are, are there any that you think we should be aware of? I would say uh, uh, one other very significant piece of water legislation was legislation that transferred the right jurisdiction that is currently at TCEQ over to the BUC. The, uh, the history of that is the, the legislation was passed back in the 70s to create uh, some state jurisdiction over the economics water and wastewater system, especially in best utilities, but to a lesser extent also water supply corporations and political subdivisions. And after about 10 years, the legislature decided that that jurisdiction would be uh, better housed at TCEQ, or what then I guess was TNRCC, than, than at the PEC, and they transferred it over to the TNRCC. Now this past session, they moved all that back to the BEC. Uh, we can sit here and talk about the reasons why they thought that was a good idea. Um, but uh, it happens over about the next year. I think it's supposed to be finalized by September of 2014. So especially if you're an investor-owned utility, it's a, it's a big deal. Uh, maybe to uh, a lesser extent, a water supply corporation, there aren't too many rate cases or political subdivisions that go to the to the agency, whatever agency that may be. In fact, uh, the jurisdiction over the rates of cities is limited to sales to out of city customers. So you don't see too many rate cases involving cities. In any case, uh, that transition is going to be very interesting to watch. And I'm sorry I'm talking to you again instead. Oh, that's miles yeah. okay. <clears throat> Uh, well, let me let me just follow up on that. Um, so, uh, there's also, uh, yeah, I guess a question there about uh, the PUC and uh, their familiarity with with water issues. I guess that's one of the things that, that they've got to to uh, um, become comfortable with. Uh, how long does it does it take to do something like that uh, for them to? I mean, obviously they they're they know about rate rate issues for uh, electric utilities, but but water is a, a different animal. Well, the entire staff at the TCEQ will be transferred, that worked on that, juris, that that type of jurisdiction, will be transferred over to the PUC by 2014. So with that goes a lot of, a lot of expertise. But you're right, uh, regulating big electric and telephone companies is a little different than regulating small water systems around the state. So I think it will be an interesting transition. Uh, my, I was actually uh, the recipient of the jurisdiction that was transferred in the 80s to the TNRCC. And uh, my recollection was we got a whole lot of work and very little staff. It'll be interesting to see how the PUC is what has been transferred to them. So, 
it didn't sound like a lot of fun. Uh, <coughs> let me ask a few questions about the drought. Um, Brad, uh, do you see the, the drought driving surface water rights management within the various river basins of our state? I do, and I think, and Dean could speak to this as well, um, I, I think the legislature already uh, put in motion that issue uh, two sessions ago where, you know, they decided, hey, we need to have an evaluation of whether we need water masters, someone who is going to manage the diversion of surface water within the basin. And so the, the TCQ is set in motion to evaluate uh, basins, uh, and they, they've done that for, for, I think, six or six or eight basins that have been done. Um, and, and so the next question is, you know, whether and to what extent a water master is, is established. And the protocol so far has been to allow some petitioning process to create a water master. Um, essentially, the commission has said, you know, we're, we're going to defer to the water rights holders in the basin as to whether they need a manager. Um, and we've seen here recently in the Brazos River Basin uh, a contested case hearing that went through September finished up. They've actually done their closing arguments and we're waiting on a proposal for a decision to determine whether a water master is in, indeed needed in the Brass River Basin. Now, I would submit to you that uh, we've had three calls, three priority calls in the Brazos Basin in the last two years. Um, there is a legitimate question about that. The, the issue that I think is it, was at play in that case really was is there a threat and a need and, and quite honestly is, is the entire basin, should the entire basin have a water master? In other words, you know, you've got folks in West Texas that have limited resources. Do they really need to be paying into a bucket to manage what uh, essentially two of my clients up there have reservoirs that have almost gone empty? And so why should they pay that freight, if you will, for bureaucratic management for a resource that they're not going to get the benefit of? So I, I think, you know, it definitely uh, is set in motion. I think we're probably going to see more, more water masters established because they're it's probably a more efficient way of handling disputes between surface water rights holders. Uh, of course, I work for the Pueblo Blanco River Authority. We have a water master, and and uh, you know everybody seems to really think that's a, a great idea. But you know the other river basins, you know, west of where uh, you were talking about a moment ago, there's there's a lot of resistance to that, and I'm not I'm not always. Uh, certain I understand why they're so concerned about it because it, it does seem to be a real benefit uh, in many ways. I think it's twofold. One, it's another fee, <laughs> another taxation on the water rights community. Um, and if there hasn't been an historic issue related to priority calls, you know, downstream senior water rights that are allegedly not getting their water, then the question is why should we have, you know, the TCQ or some other branch managing us. The the benefits that I think come from water master is that when there is a dispute and you have a water master in play, it allows that group to manage the dispute rather than using the folks that are handling permitting or the general field ops uh, staff from TCQ that really focus on, you know, water quality issues or drinking water issues that aren't always involved in water rights. It allows the water master to handle that rather than use resources from within the commission that arguably should be doing what they normally do and getting permits out. Dean, uh, uh, Brad alluded to this. I'm just curious, how has the drought affected activities at uh, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality? Well, we, we can start with the water master since that's, that's the uh, program you've been talking about. Just to step back for a second and look at this from a big picture uh, State water, surface water is state water, unlike groundwater. Uh, there's never been any confusion, at least in our lifetimes, that it was owned by the state of Texas, and the, the state has issued permits for the use of surface water now for about 100 years. But they haven't had active enforcement programs to manage the permits that have been issued that are basically competing against each other for water, especially during droughts, except for uh, South Texas and the program over in a part of the Colorado River, the upper Colorado River Basin. There was a time when uh, the plan of the state agency, the TNRCC or the TCEQ today, was to create water master programs, active enforcement programs around the state. But 
there was a lot of opposition to that, including with some very key people over at the legislature, and so they abandoned that idea. In 2011, in the sunset bill for the TCEQ, uh, the legislature directed the agency to go back and look at whether it was feasible to create water master programs in all those areas of the state where they did not exist. And they started with the, the Colorado and the Brazos River basins and decided for whatever reason not to create water master programs there. I don't know if they considered the other areas of the state yet. But in the meantime, because of Brown activities, they've got petitions to kind of rethink uh, th those decisions, particularly in the Brazos River Basin. So now they're in a contested case hearing process on whether they should create that in the Brazos. Um, absent water masters, the agency has to find the resources during droughts to respond to complaints by water right holders against other water right holders, or maybe illegal diverters for that matter, that they claim are taking their water. And that's uh, generally referred to as the prior call process. There was also some legislation passed in the Sunset Bill in 2011 that gave the agency a little more direction on how they respond to prior calls. And I know they've had a lot of activity uh, because of drought activities in going through rulemaking and trying to address uh, enforcement issues outside of the Water Master Program. I guess the other area of, of uh, activity that really gets ramped up during drought is trying to help water systems, particularly small systems, that are about to run out of water, find some alternative sources. And so, uh, you know, the agency uh, monitors those activities. There was legislation passed this session that requires more reporting by water systems when they're near running out of water. Uh, and they really have a lot to do during droughts. And a lot of that's not funded specifically. They've got to find resources to do that by taking it from, from other areas. So, yeah. Well, you just mentioned finding new sources of water. And uh, I'm a bad joke teller, but uh, there's this joke that's been going around that says uh, uh, the good news is that we're going to be drinking our wastewater, and the, the bad news is there's not enough of it. Uh, and uh, so, Brad, I, I'm going to ask you uh, about reuse and how you see the drought driving reuse uh, projects, particularly uh, uh, portable uh, reuse projects. Yeah, no, that's, that's a very good point. I mean, you know, what, where we're at right now, as Ken mentioned, we've got limited supplies. We've got to figure out ways to conserve and reuse and recycle what we have. And so I think from you know, the Water Environment Association perspective, which is what I'm here today, you know, it's the water quality side of things, um, what we've seen is a very heightened interest in <clears throat> reuse, not only just the, the, you know, getting the treated effluent from your wastewater plant to a golf course, which is kind of the standard thing, or providing it to the industry for cooling purposes, uh, but really taking it to the next level, and that is using it for potable consumption. And we've had three projects, um, one of which I've worked on, the city of Big Spring, the city of Brownwood, and the city of Wichita Falls, that have all come with these very unique projects of, hey, we're going to take that treated effluent from our wastewater plant, and we're going to take it and straight to our water treatment facilities, and we're going to use enhanced treatment. It's not going to be conventional water treatment. It's going to be membranes, UV disinfection, whatever it might need to be, but those wastewater plants rain every day. <laughs> they rain every day, and so there is water. It's real water. It's not paper water. Let's figure out a way to use it, and so I think that that's the next big challenge because right now the regulations don't really address that. There aren't clean regulatory processes for getting those types of authorizations uh, because it's really a source water issue and you've got to make sure that the source water meets the Safe Drinking Water Act requirements. So it's a treatment issue that TCQ, and in fact there's a water Belmore study ongoing right now that Dr. Mace is involved in, uh, that's looking at how do we establish those basic parameters that are needed you know, to ensure the public is going to have safe drinking water if you, use, if you go pursue these projects. So I think the drought has really enhanced the, the interest in that. Well, some of that reused water is maybe downstream for a 
the users? How are we are we really sorted that out yet? Well, I would submit to you that the law is very clear. You have the right to use and beneficially reuse any water that you diverted, and so there is no obligation to discharge. In other words, you have to get the authority to discharge to a receiving water, and that's a permit that you get for a period of three to five years. So there's no obligation that you continue to discharge. You have to, you know, get the right to do that. And so um, I don't think there's a question in that regard. I think there is a fundamental question about what does the environment need. Uh, but I don't think you can force someone to continue to operate a wastewater treatment facility that, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we didn't want. We thought that was the worst thing ever. But now because it produces effluent, we see the value in it, and we want it to continue to operate. Um, I think the law is pretty clear in that regard. So, uh, Ken, um, you know, we've been going for about 40 or uh, 50 minutes in the the term climate change has not come up yet. Um, so, I'm sorry, this is Texas. We yeah, don't I, 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 <laughs> so, uh, there's a recent poll that says that 84% of Texans believe that uh, uh, climate change is happening. Uh, and uh, I'm, act, I'm just going to wondering what impacts will climate change have on the state water planning process? Uh, that's a great question. Um, the issue has come up. Um, it has been a criticism made in some quarters about uh, of the water planning process. You know, we're uh, we tend to plan for what we know, and what we know is sort of based upon our recent history with regard to uh, rainfall and water supplies and um, the habitats and all that. Uh, but with climate change, and there. Are as you said, uh, a majority of Texans actually do think climate change has happened and is happening. Um, we're seeing, uh, you know, some of our future forecasts in doubt in terms of dependability of water supplies in certain parts of the state. Uh, and yes, it's true that any one year drought or any one <coughs> period of drought uh, cannot necessarily uh, you know, be considered as a reflection of the future per se. We've had droughts on a recurring basis in Texas uh, throughout recorded history and as some of your studies have indicated in prehistory. Um, and um, and so, you know, that continues to be sort of a, a, a debate or discussion. But whether you consider uh, the hot and dry weather that we experienced, for example, in 2011, uh, or in this year, uh, as part of a longer term trend or not, uh, we have to, I think, take into account the fact that in Texas, historically, we've had very hot and dry periods, and we are probably looking at a future where there are going to be more uh, periods of hot, dry weather, uh, and we need to take that into consideration in our water planning. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many of us emphasize the uh, more efficient use of existing water supplies, the conservation approach, uh, because the more we can reduce on a per capita basis uh, the amount of water that we need to carry out our economic and other enterprises, uh, the better able we can address uh, the climate changes that are occurring and will occur in the future uh, because we'll be weaned off of some of the you know, profuse use of water that we have experienced in the past and been accustomed to. And again, I would say, and I, this is not the panacea, even if we address this, but we need to come to grips with how much water we actually put on outdoor landscaping in the state. Uh, and I think really have a, a change of perspective in terms of where the better use of water is. Uh, that will help a lot. Uh, we've seen a lot of progress in agricultural water conservation in terms of uh, more efficient irrigation systems and things like that. Uh, there's still progress to be made. Uh, but, you know, in reality, I think what I'm saying is that the things that we need to do to address having a dependable water supply for the future uh, in terms of potential impacts of climate change are the things we ought to be doing anyway, and that is becoming more efficient our use of water, which will actually be an economic benefit the water users, uh, regardless of what happens in the future. You mentioned uh, urban uh, water use for, for landscapes. I just want to note that uh, the Water Journal published an article on that subject uh, 
this summer that that, uh, that, was, that was a quite good one. Uh, now, okay, I've got a final question for each one of you. It's the same question, uh, and then we'll uh, try to take some questions from the audience if they have any. So this question, and we'll start with you, Stacey, is, oh, oh, we forgot about groundwater. Uh, <laughs> You were like sending me a mental message, asked about Bragg and, and Dan Daniel. Uh, so, what on earth do those court cases mean? I, I mean, can people regulate groundwater in Texas now? I mean, yes, I think I think the best way to look at a day and Bragg, which you know some people call Bragg, you know, day chapter two or something. Um, I think the best way to look at those is, is what we know and what we don't know. And, and what we know is that there is a constitutionally protected interest in groundwater in place that cannot be taken for public use without adequate com compensation. But that, that constitutionally protected in interest is subject to the rule of capture, which we all know what the rule of capture is. It means basically that I don't owe my neighbor compensation if, they drill, drill a well, if I drill a well and it makes their well go dry. Um, so it's not really a rule of ownership, it's a rule of liability. And then it's also subject to the police regulations, management by a GCD in accordance with Chapter 36. So, so we know that some regulation is okay. Um, and we know in those, those court, both of those court cases that the EAA did exactly what it was statutorily mandated to do. Um, in both cases, the court decided that. But, but what we don't know is you know, how much regulation is too much. We know you can't just deny all, all you know, the entire permit, um, except in some potential instances. But um, the other question is, what distinction might evolve uh, between the EAA and other GCDs, we know the EAA, as I know you're very aware, Todd, is, is a little different than other Chapter 36 districts where it has a statutory cap on how much water it can permit. But as I talked about before, with the DFCs and, and tools, there's a little bit more flexibility with other Chapter 36 districts. So we haven't had those questions in the rest of the state. It, it, the EAA is always kind of the test case for that. So how will that, you know, go elsewhere? Um, how might different uses be affected? And, and finally, what, what might be the unintended consequences? Because while I think day, day, um, day specifically makes it very clear that GCDs can still regulate, might you have some hesitation by local boards um, for fear of litigation, especially as we get more and more users in the door? Um, and, and as you know, Bragg talks a little bit more about how to compensate those landowners when a taking occurs. And I think, I think the thing, you know, Bragg is, that was a court of appeals decision. So I think it's still unsettled. I think most districts are still doing what they've been statutorily um, required to do, and it's kind of a wait and see is, is what most districts are, are thinking. I'm sure, I don't know, Ken, if you... I, you know, a lot of people, uh, first of all, I'm not a lawyer. Therefore, I can spout legal opinion without <laughs> fear of <my> saying. <laughs> uh, a lot of people asked me last year in February, I think in 2012, was when the day decision came down. Uh, that was the one that you know established uh, uh, some victim about uh, the rights of ownership of groundwater. Uh, but what what does this mean? And basically, what I said was, what it means is that there are going to be a lot more court cases about groundwater <laughs> in the near future, uh, because you can talk to uh, four or five different groundwater rights or groundwater attorneys, and you'll get probably 10 different interpretations <laughs> of what that particular case and that decision led to. Uh, because there are a lot of unanswered questions, as Stacy said. Like, you know, okay, there is a right of ownership, uh, but there are all these other things that actually impact that. And how much ownership do you really have if you don't quantify and actually know how much groundwater you can take from underneath your land? Uh, it's always been a little bit of a difficulty for me, I'm pretty simple-minded, uh, to try to figure out that if you've got one acre of land, then, you know, how much water under that one acre of land are you really entitled to? Uh, because anybody who has a well right next to your one acre of land can pump water, and over a period of time, you may not have any water under your land. So, so where's your protection of the right of ownership there? We need to have reasonable regulation of groundwater, and that's what groundwater conservation districts, BCDs, are there for. Um, but I think we're going to see a lot of discussion about, well, what can a groundwater district actually do in terms of limiting withdrawal 
uh, in terms of putting other restrictions. Uh, it seems that the law and the courts have said that they have some authority in that regard, but they may face a so-called takings claim, which means that uh, some landowner could say that you've taken my groundwater right through your regulation, and therefore you owe me money, uh, just as if the highway department, for example, <coughs> takes land for a highway, uh, then they have to compensate the landowner for that. So there's a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, if you're looking for a career in law, I would re recommend groundwater law uh, because there will be lots of opportunities for you in the near future. So clear as mud. Yeah, That's right. exactly. Okay. So now we can get to the final question, scripted question here. And uh, Stacy, you're the closest to me, so I'll start off with you. Um, so what do you think is the biggest threat to Texas water future? And uh, do you think we're doing enough to understand that threat you know, or address it? It can be anything. Can I phone a friend? <laughs> you, can, you can make an expert. No, no, oh, I, yeah. no the biggest threat, you know, I, I think it's just planning for, um, you know, the doubling of, of our population in, in, in the next, what, by 2060, we'll have double population. And how are we going to provide enough water for all of those people, in addition to the environmental needs, um, and, and making sure uh, that, that, that that need is, is... And I think Ken is right when he talks about outdoor, outdoor landscaping and things like that. that. That's what I think about when, when, I, when, I, when I think about my grandchildren, and they'll look at me and say, you put potable water on the lawns, and I'll be very proud that I say, you know, I didn't. But, 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 but I think that I'll that... I'll say my wife did. Oh. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. Yeah, but I, I, I think that, although I can change, I, I might, I reserve the right to change my answer based on what these brilliant guys say. <laughs> oh, my goodness, it's very oh. brilliant. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, here's, you know, like a news flash. The environmentalist is going to say the biggest threat in terms of water is that uh, we're not going to have enough water to meet environmental water needs. We're not going to maintain enough water uh, in stream for our rivers uh, to maintain riparian habitat, uh, to maintain all the important things that go along with having a healthy river system. And we're not going to have adequate freshwater inflows, at least at certain times, uh, to our coastal basin estuaries to maintain long-term uh, the productivity of those basin estuaries, which is immensely important not just to the environment of the state of Texas, but to the economy of the coast and of the state of Texas. Uh, and it's not just uh, commercial fishing. Uh, it's not just recreational fishing. Uh, it's really the whole tourist economy that is built upon the allure of the coast, uh, the availability of seafood in vast quantities and things of that nature. Uh, we've seen some very uh, depressing uh, situations uh, in terms of Texas coastal bays and estuaries, especially with oyster populations uh, over the past couple of years as a result of very limited inflows into the bays and estuaries. Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen recently in the news here in Austin uh, the controversy at the Lower Colorado River Authority, or LCRA, uh, over maintaining flows uh, from the Highland Lakes downstream to uh, Matagorda Bay. And of course there's a, uh, I hate to mention this talk, but there's this court case that uh, <laughs> affects the Guadalupe River system. Yeah. Uh, no one's ever heard much about that one. Yeah. 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 At any rate, uh, it's before the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals right now, the Federal Court of Appeals. Uh, so I really do truly think that the big threat that we have in Texas in terms of water is that potentially, maybe not in my lifetime, but in my daughter's lifetime or grandchildren's lifetime, uh, should I be so fortunate, uh, that uh, <laughs> some people are going to wake up and say, what happened to our rivers? What happened to our bays and estuaries? Uh, you know, I agree that wastewater reuse is a good thing, but we also have to look on a situational basis, I think, at each one of the reuse projects and make sure that it doesn't take away from flows that are necessary in our rivers and streams in order to maintain these values that all of us, I think, really hold dear. Um, I'm just concerned that we are chipping away at our uh, environmental water 
and making it less likely that we're going to have that in the future if we don't do something pretty dramatic about that. Dean, uh, same question for you. I would say, uh, I wouldn't use the word threat. I'd say we've got a lot of challenges. And it starts with the fact that Texas is a very desirable place to live. <laughs> and we've still got a whole lot of people coming to Texas every day, as was pointed out at the, at the front end of this. And so we've got a lot of competition for limited water supplies, uh, for people, for the environment, uh, for recreational uses, and other things. And, and uh, you know, we, we're moving slowly along, trying to address those those issues one at a time as, as they come along. But I believe we're going to we'll solve our problems. And I hope we solve them with a lot of, without a whole lot of help from the federal government. I wouldn't mention that as the biggest threat, but it certainly, it, you know, is, is something I'd like, I'd like to keep these decisions being made in Texas, not the federal government. Great. So, Brad, you're, you're my last one. Thankfully, they didn't steal my answer. I had no problem talking to me. Seriously. I, I think the biggest threat we have is that we come out of the drought and the public forgets. It's happening. You know, right now we have the public's attention and they realize, hey, water is valuable. Now, they hadn't figured out that they're going to go to 7 Eleven and they're going to spend $1.19 for that little bottle of Aquafina and then they're going to complain that they're spending. Five dollars and twenty-five cents a thousand gallons to the city of Austin. Whatever the number is here, I'm not quoting that. Ever. But whatever the number is, it's the concept of the value of water. And you know, when you talk to uh, Gabriel Eckstein, who's a professor at the now Texas A&M Law School, um, that's one of his biggest passions: is getting the public to understand the value of water. What is the value and ethic of water? And right now, we have their attention. And I think we need to seize upon that, like we did with Prop Six, with good education outreach. But getting folks to understand that this is a natural resource, if it's something you need, you need to understand the value of that and compare it to what you're paying for gas. Or yourself. The, 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 work, the biggest example I heard about that was when someone came in and they told a utility that they couldn't pay their water bill because they had to pay their cell phone bill. Okay, What do you really need to live? Do you need a cell phone to live? I mean, arguably today's society maybe so, but you know, getting the public to understand that this is a real resource that you need and we have their attention right now. Well, I, I, you know, I really do agree with this thought that, uh, uh, you know, if we value water, it doesn't, doesn't make all that much sense to take water as treat, treated to drink water standards and you know, put it on your lawn. Uh, and I think think probably that is something that's changing. And I kind of agree, you know, 10, 15 years, you know, that may be fairly uncommon, but we'll see. Uh, okay, we, we've gotten through all the questions I had, and so this is the chance for people in the audience to ask questions. And we also, I think, are going to try to get some questions through the webcast, if, if that works out. But uh, would you like to go first? If you don't mind. Sure. Um, passing Proposition 6 is great, but um, the rulemaking won't be completed till what, March of 2015? Something like that. And I'm just curious to find out what the panel thinks how that might change pers perspective on the whole thing. I mean, how quickly the, the money gets into the system to... Well, I mean, it's politicized, system. you know. The people who are making the rules will be um, people, I don't know, a complete group of House of Representatives. Senate. So, I mean, it op opens the door for, you know, what people perceive... Prop six to do is solve all of our problems when you know politics comes into play. Well, I'll take that one first, uh, just because it's been on my mind today about Prop six implementation. Uh, having gone to water belt board meeting this morning, uh, you know, I think that there is um, a good deal of commitment and dedication from uh, on the part of the new leadership at the water belt board. Uh, to actually take Prop 6 and House Bill 4, it's enabling legislation, uh, and make it work. Um, I think that they feel, for example, that the 
conservation commitment that was made in House Bill 4, which was dependent upon the passage of Prop 6, uh, is a very firm commitment and actually a mandate from the legislature that they raise the profile of conservation uh, as part of the way to address our state's water problems. Um, and Carlos Rubenstein, who's the new chairman of the Water Belt Board, has made it very clear that he thinks that uh, the 20% commitment of the new funding for conservation or reuse is a floor and not a ceiling, and that he intends to go above and beyond that, if at all possible. But remember that it's not just the Water Development Board, the people in Austin, who actually are going to make the difference in terms of implementation of this new funding. Uh, it's the people in the regional water planning areas, uh, the regional water planning groups that actually draw up the regional plans, which come to make up the state water plan, where really the first uh, arena is for trying to address some of these issues. Uh, because the new funding mechanism is to fund projects that are called for in the state water plan, which is made up of all these regional plans. And if you don't have a project in a regional plan, and therefore the state water plan, it's not even going to be eligible for funding. Um, and that means that those of us who are conservationists really need to get there and argue in each regional water planning area for conservation to be a major part of what that regional water planning area is recommending to the state. Um, so I, I want to make that point because a lot of times we think, well, all this new legislation, this proposed constitutional amendment that's now been passed by the voters, uh, okay, now it's the role of the state officials to make this happen. Well, yes, there are lots of important responsibilities the state officials have for making House Bill 4 and Prop 6 work, but it actually all starts at the regional planning level, and that's where each one of you can have an impact by bringing your views to those regional planning groups in trying to push projects that you think are reasonable, approaches that you think will help to solve the problem, uh, and that's really where it all starts. Well, the first round will be dealing with what's already in the 2012 plan, so how much is in there for conservation? Well, as I said, the, the, the plans <coughs> call for roughly 34% of the state's water needs over the next 50 years. Uh, to be met through conservation or reuse. Uh, but a lot of that is not specific as to well, what real project is tied to that conservation goal. And so I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done to try to make that more specific so that it's actually something that can be funded. Uh, the Water Development Board uh, and others have sort of used the term trial run <laughs> in terms of the uh, initial prioritization of projects that are currently in the state water plan. Uh, and frankly, I don't see uh, the possibility that a lot of money from this new funding mechanism is going to come out the door uh, for the projects that are currently in uh, the 2012 state water plan. Uh, I think it's going to really be focused on the things that come out of what will be the 2017 state water plan. Uh, because we're already in the middle of revising those water plans, uh, and I think there are going to be a lot of revisions, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. And just the timing doesn't work out, really, for money to get out the door for those projects. Dean, did you want to add something? Well, I, I wanted to mention that the Water Development Board was created after the drought of the 50s as a planning and a financing agency, and they've been providing financial assistance for water projects for 50 years. Uh, this, this recent activity with House Bill 4, the Constitutional Amendment, uh, was out of a realization that it was the, the, the Water Development Board's activities in the, in the past for financial assistance have been funded with appropriations of general revenue from the state. And uh, sometimes when you're in bad economic times, it's hard to find GR uh, for development board financing when you're competing against education and transportation and health and human services and things like that. So over 
more than a decade now, the legislature has been looking at ways to keep, to provide a significant infusion of money to the board uh, to kind of enhance the financial activities that have been ongoing for decades. And with that $2 billion have come a lot of instruction uh, through House Bill 4 on how they're supposed to prioritize projects, how they're supposed to divide the money between conservation and a new water development project and an agricultural irrigation project and that sort of thing. So yes, they do have a, a lot of work to do and they've got a whole new structure at the agency to do that do that with. But it's not like they don't have any experience at all in financing water projects. And as Ken points out, ultimately, these aren't state projects. They're local projects that that can probably be implemented much cheaper with some state financial assistance, but still it's going to be largely the burden of the local folks to carry those out. So. We ready to move on to another question, or anybody want to add anything to that? Anybody else have a question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, Bridget. Yeah, yeah uh, it seems like uh, one of the ways to, to get to a drought is by having enough water in storage, and the 2012 state water plan shows that there's been a 45% reduction in reservoir storage per capita since the 1970s. So any thoughts on aquifer storage and recovery or putting excess reused water in aquifers or storm water or other approaches to storm more water to get to droughts? Let me, let me just restate that question so that we make sure people can, can hear. Uh, essentially, uh, we've had a reduction per capita storage, about 45%. I guess maybe the peak was around 1980 or, or so. And... Uh, you know, what are we doing to, to develop new storage, uh, you know, particularly ASR and uh, aquifer storage and recovery right. uh, and other other potential storage and, projects. And I, and I should have mentioned that when I was talking about what's going to come up in the legislative session. Um, there was a bill last session about aquifer storage and recovery, and um, it definitely makes a lot of practical sense. I know, Bridget, you know this very well, you know, the evaporative losses that we have from our reservoir. So... It makes sense. We have a unique situation in Texas where we have privately owned groundwater, so if we're injecting water into an area that's over a GCD, how do we transactionally make sure that we're, you know, contemplating all of the um, different scenarios? But uh, there was a start with that bill. I'm certain that that will be on the table on TAG, and I, and I know TPCA um, and stakeholders are working on coming up with a package that would provide folks who put water into the ground with some certainty. I know SAWS is already doing it, and they're their strategy is just to kind of keep buying land so that they kind of have a buffer. Um, but not everybody's going to be able to do that. And so I think, I, I certainly think there'll probably be a legislative solution to that in order to incentivize it more. Uh, I expect the number you refer to, the storage number per capita, is related directly to storage in reservoirs, surface yeah. water projects. And, you know, after the drought of the 1950s, a lot of, if you look at the history of, of building reservoirs in Texas, the drought of the 1950s spurred a lot of activity in, in developing these surface water projects. That activity basically shut down probably in the 80s. And so I don't think we've built another major reservoir in Texas in the last 25 years. Uh, and uh, some of our state leaders two decades ago said we'd probably never build another major reservoir project in Texas. But there are some in the kind of in the pipeline now getting permits or seeking permits both from the state and the federal governments. And so uh, I think that makes up about 17% of the additional needs in the state water plant, surface water reservoir projects. So, uh, you know, I think they're once again, is some renewed interest in, in building some new reservoirs in Texas. We're not just talking about storage on the ground. We're talking about building some more surface water projects. Yeah. And Todd, if I may, I, I would say that I think ASR is definitely one of the tools of toolbox. I mean, you look at a portfolio. If you look at your water spot portfolio, is everything, right? You have conjunctive use of groundwater, surface water. You've got reuse. You've got everything. ASR is one of them. The thing to keep in mind is what Stacy mentioned is the legal treatment 
of groundwater is different than the legal treatment of surface water. Secondarily, if you're going to scout and, and actually have a functioning ASR project, you've got to catch those peak flows. And from an engineering perspective, and I'll put that on, hat on for a second, you're not going to go out and build a, a pump station to divert hundreds of thousands of gallons of water that may only turn on once every year. You've got to have a bucket that captures the flows that you can then ASR. And so we, we have to keep that practical reality in mind when we think about how we're going to use ASR. And ASR uh, is, I mean, the first project was incredible in the 70s, I think. And so it's not, I mean, it's obviously SAUCE has got a big project, and uh, but it's not really, it's not really taken off in many ways. It's really been slow to be adapted. Well, here. yeah, I mean, but I, I do think it's maybe poised to take off, or at least to expand. Um, you know, I, I probably disagree with Brad and Dean a little bit about the future of surface water reservoirs in Texas. Um, I, Dis disagreements allowed, by the way. <laughs> well, I sort of thought you wanted that, actually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, even some water utility officials or people who are close to the water industry in Texas will tell you publicly now, a lot have said this privately, that they don't expect more than a handful uh, new surface water reservoirs, at least on-channel water reservoirs, uh, to be built in Texas in the future. Uh, that they're too costly, even with, you know, new state financial assistance. Uh, there is too much uh, landowner opposition, increasing landowner opposition, I would say. Uh, there are all the permitting obstacles, uh, as well as the environmental concerns. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm not saying no new reservoir will ever be built in Texas. I, I think that there probably will be some, but this is not the wave of the future. I mean, in the drought that we've been experiencing over the past couple of years, especially in West Texas, we have bone dry reservoirs. You don't have a dependable water supply if you have bone dry reservoirs. Uh, and so we can't, you know, Reservoirs have lots of benefits, and certainly they've been important in the past, but I just don't think you can play on that. Food. You got that on tape, by the way, you just <laughs> said. <laughs> I have recreated in some okay. reservoirs. Okay. <laughs> Even I have been on a lake. <laughs> but... I'm just saying, in the future, <laughs> don't plan on a lot of new surface water reservoirs, at least on the river channels. Well, uh, you know, something uh, related to that, uh, of course, there's the big issue with the use of the Highland Lakes now. And uh, there are a lot of other lakes, large water supply lakes in the state, that have, uh, you know, summer homes around them and, and things like that. Do you, you think that's going to be... Uh, the same type of issue with some of these other water supply reservoirs where the, the, the uh, folks who own property around that are going to uh, uh, be more resistant to use of the reservoir. Well, I, I think definitely that wherever you have uh, people who have, you know, an economic interest, including property uh, around a reservoir, that they're going to be concerned about lake levels and things like that. Of course, as we know, they're different, you know, operating procedures and rules covering different lakes in the state of Texas. Some are supposed to be constant level lakes uh, where you maintain a certain level. Uh, some are not constant level lakes. Uh, and some are not supposed to be constant level lakes, but the people who own the property around them think they are constant <laughs> level lakes uh, and don't want to see their lake levels drop. So, yes, of course, I think there's going to be a lot of concern and issues like that. We're going to have to address these things. They're going to be tough issues to deal with. Let's have another question. Stephen. Uh, from a conservation and rates perspective, kind of carrying on that dialogue a little bit, um, the city of Austin has been in drought two stage restrictions since 2011. Uh, the average household has used 1,000 gallons less uh, in 2012 than they did in 2011. The city of Austin is coming out with, or proposing to come up with drought rates in order to make up for lost revenue. How do we deal with that issue in light of conservation uh, when the public's already conserving and then municipalities are turning around and charging those of us that are conserving more money? 
We're good. Okay. Well, I'm none of us operate a utility, so I'll start with that. Yeah, my God. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's a real issue, Stefan, and, and I think um, conservation is important, but, you know, it's a fixed cost. You've still got, if you have bond debt you know, that you have from issuing for that water treatment plant or whatever that project is, you still have to cover that cost. You still have the same amount of staff. You've got chemical costs to operate your water treatment plant. These are real hard costs that have to be recovered. And so, you know, it, it is a balancing act in terms of how you adjust the rates equitably when you, you're telling people, hey, we don't want you to use that much water anymore. Um, and it's a real struggle for a utility. It's not just the city of Austin. It's utilities across the state. Right, because, yeah. you know, then, then, then you talk, it, it propagates into the city in general because a lot of the utility, the water, you know, the water is a revenue generating side and other portions of a, of a city are not... <laughs> revenue generating and so the, the taking out of the bucket that would otherwise have gone to Parks and Rec or you pick the other side of the utility. It, it, is, it is a struggle, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Brad has, uh, you know, uh, really put his finger on a big issue uh, that many of us have not always um, dealt with uh, in a real direct way, in a, you know, successful way. Uh, but one of the things that, um, like Sierra Club and National Wildlife Federation, who are partners in uh, the Texas Living Waters Project, uh, over the past two years have, have done in coordination with others like the Alliance for Water Efficiency and the Texas Water Foundation, is that we've tried to put some uh, emphasis on exploring this issue of how water utility professionals and managers uh, can maintain the financial viability of their utilities while still promoting actively water conservation. Uh, and in fact, uh, we've had uh, some symposia in uh, Houston, uh, most recently here in Austin, on that very issue and brought in people from outside of Texas, uh, not from California, not from the federal government, uh, from North Carolina and other viable southern states uh, who uh, have wrestled with this issue and are experts in how you design a rate structure to be able to accomplish maintaining financial stability while also encouraging conservation. And I think actually the San Antonio Water System, or SAWS, uh, is a good example of a utility that has come to understand that you can structure your rates in a way that you do maintain those important goals, both of which are important to a water utility and to a community. Uh, and I think we're going to see more emphasis on that. Uh, I do believe that you know it is still responsible in a drought uh, when you're having to reduce water use uh, to change or have a drought surcharge or something like that so that you actually do have to impose a higher per unit rate on the people who are using a greater amount of water. Uh, because not everybody cuts back to the same level uh, during a drought situation. And I think while that is painful, politically and otherwise, that it's still a responsible thing to consider. Bill, you had a question. I do. Uh, there was an article in the Austin American Statesman out recently, and it was talking about Austin, City of Austin, like Stephen had said, has been in drought to water restrictions, uh, and that uh, cuts back on the amount of irrigation in times of the week that somebody can irrigate. We have some leaders in the state that uh, have, in this apparently according to this article, have drilled the well so they can irrigate their, yard, their yards. Greg Abbott, Ben Crenshaw, these type of people. What what is it in our law? That, uh, and I know that you said there's a difference between surface water and groundwater, but what is it that's allowing somebody to be able to go in and bypass what the rest of the community is doing and uh, proceed with that kind of irrigation? Well, thank God, that's a question. We talk about drinking Yeah. Well, well, well. <laughs> I'm going to talk about groundwater regulation generally. You know, if, if Western Travis County was in a groundwater conservation district, that wouldn't be an example. Because, in it, you know, according to Chapter 36 of the Water Code, you have to have 10 acres, your well can be 25,000 gallons a day or less, and it's for domestic and livestock use. So, most, I, I mean, I don't, I've never been to Greg Evans' house. I don't know how much land he has. But usually, you know, that's happening in, in where I live, too, these small two-acre tracts of property um, my neighbor, my neighbor wanted to do the same thing and drill a well, and 
you know, we have day that, that essentially says you own, you have a right to capture the water beneath your land. And so that, that is a property right. I do think it will be interesting from the standpoint of maybe future takings liability. You have some cities that might say, well, we want, really want to protect our aquifer. And we don't want so many holes in the ground, so if you're within our city limits, you can't drill a well. And, you, and I, do, I do think there's some cities that do that. And that under day, that's a total, you know, even if it's a one acre or five acre lot within the city, that says no drill. You cannot capture any groundwater. And maybe the first big takings case post day in Bragg will be that kind of situation. Not necessarily against a GCD who's rarely going to say no altogether, um, but they might say, you know, you might have a city that says that. So, you know, I, I don't, I didn't really answer your question. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to it. <laughs> yes, sir. I think part of the answer lies that the, the, the if, there, if there is a solution to the water issue, you have to build a water grid that's not a whole lot different from our electrical grid. We're, we're connecting groundwater with surface water, ASR, uh, sharing it with rainy areas from non rainy areas. And with that, just like the water, just like electricity, you're going to have a, when you need water in a drought time, you're going to have membrane treated water in some possible, which is going to increase conservation because nobody's going to spend that kind of money to keep the roses alive when it costs that kind of money. And that'll be how the cost goes up in the drought times when you have to go to an ASR where you've got that money, you've got that water membrane created, stored, repumped. I mean, it takes a lot of energy and money to pump water around. Uh, and I think that's how that's going to be solved because surface water, what we have now, is the cheapest water you can get. So any answer we have other than existing surface water is going to cost us more, which will drive the conservation, which will allow the, the, the drought costs to go up. So, uh, you know, grid system for, for water, uh, you know, that's essentially kind of what the 68 water plan was in some ways. Uh, really big grid. Yeah. You've, that idea has come up again some here recently. What, what, what do you all think about that? Well, I, I, I think you're going to see, you know, some additional movement of water around from one region of the state to another. Um, I don't think there's much question about that. I think there are a lot of... Um, you know, concerns about how that's done, and I do think you have to be careful about that. I don't, I don't personally think you can have a water grid in the same way that you have an electricity grid, um, because water is a different substance, if you will, a different creature, uh, and so much uh, of the value of water uh, is in what it provides to the environment, which is what we really. Uh, depend upon in many ways for some of our other values. Uh, and so, you know, just moving water around creates some impacts upon the environment that have to be addressed. Um, and I, I think it's difficult to try to have a water grid in the same sense you have an electric grid. Now, you can maybe in some respects have a virtual water grid, if you will. Uh, there are uh, agreements that can be made, for example, San Antonio Water System has agreements with farmers, irrigators in the western part of the Edwards, southern Edwards, uh, that are called dry year options, where basically during a, a dry year, anticipated dry year, uh, the farmers uh, do not draw from the aquifer as <coughs> they do during wet years or more normal rainfall years. Uh, and they get paid by the San Antonio Water System for that. So then San Antonio Water System can use some of the drilling rights, if you will, of the farmers uh, in order to meet their water needs. So, you know, you have things like that that don't really make for a grid, per se, but sort of have the same type of transactional uh, value uh, in terms of different people who need the water most being able to use the water. Dean, did you want to add something? I'll, I'll just say that... Uh, a water grid would be very, very expensive for starters, uh, but it is absolutely a part of our, our history in Texas to move water around from areas of plenty to areas who, that aren't quite so fortunate. Over time, though, moving water around has become much more controversial, and we've got a lot of barriers in place today that we didn't have in place decades ago uh, to, to, to moving water around, both groundwater and surface water. There's a lot of, a lot of resistance to, to export by those people who are sitting on top of the, the resource. So 
it has a lot of legal challenges with it, even if the cost were not a factor. Uh, Eric, were you able to get any questions through the webcast? No, they're patiently listening and watching. Oh, okay, okay. Was there anybody else who's got a question? No? Yes, sir. I want to, regarding agriculture, water use, uh, I know the Proposition 6 reserves, I think, 10% of the funding for agricultural projects. But I don't have a lot of optimism that they're going to really jump on this money because they basically have to build expensive projects and pay it back with cheap water. And at the same time, their uh, historic sources of funding, the uh, Bureau of Reclamation and the Natural Resource Conservation Service, are cutting back on their programs for water conservation projects. So what do you see in the future in Texas? So just to, to uh, rephrase, uh, ag... Uh, is it, are they going to get any of the Prop 6 money, you think, uh, Bureau of Reclamation and the NCRS are kind of cutting back on their their uh, expenditures? Are they going to see any benefit from, from Prop 6? Well, uh, one clarification is that uh, the way House Bill 4 is written, and that's the enabling legislature for Prop 6, uh, it says that 20% of the funding is sort of on a five-year cycle. Uh, is uh, to go, or not less than 20 percent, I should say, uh, is to be for conservation or reuse, and that may include agricultural water conservation or irrigation. Uh, and then there's another 10 percent, which I think is what you were referring to, that actually says not less than 10 percent shall be for projects in rural areas, and that can include additional agricultural water conservation, irrigation conservation projects. Um, you know, I think it's not totally clear yet how all this is going to work out. The Water Development Board, though, does have a program that's been in place for a number of years, actually a couple of programs, uh, one of which is the Agricultural Water Conservation Loan Program, and it's operated through some groundwater conservation districts where basically they get the state financial assistance from the Water Development Board. Uh, that provides them with the ability then to make agreements with uh, farmers, irrigators in their district uh, to um, install new, more water efficient irrigation equipment. In some cases, there are requirements for meters to be installed so they know how much water is being used. Uh, I think that is going to be part of the implementation of Prop 6, uh, that uh, you're going to be uh, able to achieve you know, some greater reductions in water use through that use of money. But exactly how it's going to be done, I think, still needs to be sort of worked out whether it's going to work the same way as uh, the current system of agricultural water conservation loans or not. Uh, do you have? I, I would just add, I think if you looked at a chart from the state water plan, it shows very clearly ag declining, municipal use increasing. And so I think what we're going to see is what Ken said, is that you're going to come up with more efficient ways to use ag water for ag purposes uh, because the demand's going to be going down. And I, I think that's exactly right. What about a different mixture of crops, uh, sorghum maybe instead of corn or something like that, if the ethanol programs are, are starting to, to uh, uh, tail off? Well, I, I think you're you know going to see changes like that. I don't, but that's not really, as I see it, directly related to of Prop 6 or House Bill 4. I think those things are happening in agriculture as a result of other forces, uh, but they're not being driven by the funding of the Do we have any more questions, or have you all had enough? Enough of water? We never have enough water. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, uh, I'd like to thank you all for being our, our first set of panelists at this event. Uh, I thought you all did a great job. And um, you can relax now. I didn't have any, like, really horrible question that I was going to ask you. No, I trusted um, you. We've all been before like words. That's true. That's true. And those are live stream, too. I reminded myself of that on the way here. Oh, you're right. Yeah, exactly. They're all archived, too. I've seen some of your questions. Please help me thank our panelists and the ESI for hosting us.